We just need to make sure that we're making changes within our pets' lifestyles that are reducing that impact. Yeah. And it, the significance of reducing that impact on on a personal level is, is huge. It's really big. People think that you can't do anything as an individual to, to change it. But if if everybody thought that way, then kind of nothing would, would happen. And your individual impact over the life of your your pet is, is, is really is really significant. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps keep your furry family as healthy as possible so they can live the full and happy life they deserve. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, 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 and welcome along to episode 92 of the Call the Vet show. If you're new here, welcome along. I'm Dr. Alex. I'm a companion animal veterinarian and the veterinarian behind ourpetshealth.com. And this is the podcast that helps you understand your dog or your cat, helps you optimize their health all so that they can live the full and happy life that you want for them. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, then make sure you hit that subscribe button on whichever app you're listening to the show today. And I've got a really special one for you. And the voice that you heard in the intro was the fantastic Dr. Maddie Hewitson, who is my special guest today. The environmental impact that we all have on the planet is something that many of us, most of us, and hopefully even all of us are thinking about more and more as it becomes apparent that there needs to be action from every single one of us in many different aspects of our lives to prevent climate change, to reduce the global increase in temperature and to limit the impact that we have on other ecosystems on other animals and the natural world and I've got such an important podcast for you today because you may not be aware of the impact that your dog and cat has on the planet and the role that they play and the changes that you can make and you absolutely can make these today the impact that they can have on all the different environmental issues of our time So if we want a truly healthy, diverse planet for our families to live in in the future, it's absolutely the responsibility of all of us who are fortunate enough to class dogs and cats as part of our family to make the sometimes difficult changes that need to be made. And I'd love to hear your thoughts to some of the suggestions that we speak about today. Um, So you can join in the conversation over on Instagram where you can find me at Our Pets Health. Send me a DM, leave a comment. I'd really love to hear from you. And I hope that you'll be able to share this episode with your friends and family as well, because it really is important. And the changes that we can all make really can benefit each and every one of our families well into the future. Dr. Maddie Hewitson, it's a great pleasure to welcome you onto the Call the Vets show. Thanks for spending the time to come and talk to us today. Well, no, thank you so much for getting in touch. Super, super um, excited to talk to you. So before we explore the impact that our pet dogs and cats have on the environment and what we can all do about minimising this, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your background, the work that you're doing and how you ended up in the area of animal and more specifically pet environmentalism. So I'm in first opinion practice. I've just recently graduated from Nottingham Uni and I have kind of been helping to innovate in kind of the pet health sector by creating an app called Petpanion, which provides pet health information to owners. It's very owner focused app so that people can avoid kind of the false information that's available on on Dr. Google. And so you have a easily accessible and personalized way of looking after your pet. Cool. Well, how do you how do you manage to have time to do all that as well as just come out of vet school? It, it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty intense, but it's really fun and it's extremely rewarding. I had no idea I was going to be in this kind of app development space. Yeah, and then it kind of linked in perfectly with my other passion is kind of sustainability and trying to live as sustainable as possible. And then I, the more I researched into kind of pet sustainability, the more I was shocked on the, the huge impact that pets can have on, on the planet and on, on the climate crisis. And so 
then I was like, well, it just makes perfect sense to integrate that into the app's values. So currently we are working with Dr. Pim Martins from Maastricht University and he also works at Amsterdam University and we're developing a carbon pore print calculator. So that owners can calculate the ecological impact of their pet on the planet, which is really exciting. And then give ways which they can make changes in their life to kind of reduce that impact. And also with our partners who are Sea Trees, an amazing organisation, charity, they can also offset that and, and limit it even further from that point of view. So what kind of like what kind of things do like people do, do pets have an impact on because I guess people don't think you know we're becoming an awful lot more climate aware and ecologically and environmentally aware but I imagine most pet owners or the vast majority don't really consider their pet as a big generator of you know carbon based things or um consumables and plastics and things like that so what kind of impacts do they have on the environment Yeah so it's it's really interesting so even from kind of the pet accessory so as as with kind of the human uh, clothing industry you have the pet clothing industry and the pet accessories and fast fashion kind of leaks into kind of the pet accessories that you buy too so it's kind of the manufacturing so the dyes that we use as well as in human clothing some of the dyes can be quite harmful to the environment especially if they're not disposed of correctly then uh, you have kind of the shipping of those clothing items from faraway countries the disposability of it when they enter a landfill the actual what they're made out of so polyester is from virgin petrol sources fossil fuels so it's the impact that that has as well and bear in mind that in the UK we have 50 million pets that that adds up especially across the world and then you have toys toys made out of virgin plastics again entering landfills and I if you have a a pet especially a dog you know that the indestructible ones are not not always indestructible and you can go through quite a few in your dog's lifetime so that point of view as well and then food is something that's really interesting so in terms of pet food there's been huge studies something that Dr Pim has been working on in his research there's quite a few different studies out there but it's like a a dog can create up to 10.7 million tons of greenhouse gases through their diet in one year which is kind of the ecological footprint which is equivalent to that of a person so it's a huge impact that they can that they can have and then looking into like you have the main kind of for stomached animals, methane production, so sheep, sheep and cattle, they're the food that they get that impact on the planet and then the actual animals themselves in in kind of farming, which is in the spotlight at the moment. And then you have the less carbon emitting and sequestering animal protein sources such as fish and chicken uh, or poultry in general. And then what's even more interesting is it's just it's way more complicated than just a black and white picture. There's so many different factors that have a play into this, but org- organic versus free, free range, even that difference there has a huge impact on the kind of carbon imprint that your pet is producing. And then the kind of there's something that's in the spotlight at the moment is antiparasitics and their effect on the planet. So basically leaching out into waterways if your dog goes swimming after they've had kind of a spot on product applied, that going into the water streams and affecting the aquatic life in the in the waterways. So there's so many ways that people can make a, a positive change to to the effect of that their pet is having on the environment. And there's so many brands who are kind of innovating in this space at the moment, creating like toys made from leftover chopsticks 
or chopstick waste. So bamboo is an amazing material. The more I research it, the more I love it. It sequesters up to 50% more carbon. So it's, it's an amazing material and it, it grows quickly. It requires less pesticides. It doesn't require pesticides as, as much as some of the other materials require. It's really fast growing and it's a great byproduct to use in, in toys and in accessories such as like pet bowls and in terms of even poo bags, like as such a small change you can make in your life, compostable versus biodegradable. So I think that that sphere is is really interesting and it's it's cool to kind of see where that's that's going. Yeah, yeah. And I think you said you could have mentioned how many, you know, dogs and cats there are in the UK and then there's in the US and it's across the whole world. And you think, well, a poo bag, and I've actually, yeah, written about this. It, you think oh it's nothing but actually you know you're using one a day that really adds up no matter how thin that plastic is if you're using a plastic based one then there are you know there's some pretty reasonable alternatives out there and if everyone makes that change then yeah the impact can be huge and with the accessories it's just the same as us we're switching trying to switch that mindset to you know going down the pound shop or the dollar store and buying cheap rubbish that lasts for a day but you know oh well my dog has fun with it so that's all okay and really switching to go well actually that's a huge waste and where's that going to go it's going to end up in landfill it's going to be producing you know loads of horrible things it'll end up in the sea um so yeah there's all that kind of thing um the 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 parasite control that's a really interesting one because there has just been the report that's come out so um yeah did you want to maybe mention a bit talk a bit more about that like as far as i'm aware it's like there's a couple of products that are only really found in pet parasite control at the moment or that's their main use and they've been found in like every every river in the UK is that right yeah so it's it's kind of a controversial topic within the vet sphere at the moment um, and one that's got a lot of media attention at the moment um because of the controversy I guess because as as vets, we want to be able to prophylactically treat diseases that can be prevented, especially as easy as something like a spot on or something that you give to your to your dog, which stops them transmitting disease to you uh, as a pet owner too. And it's something that's kind of been ingrained in society for such a long time now that it's it's kind of part of owning a pet. You know that you flea and worm monthly or every three months or, or six months in some cases. So having this evidence come out, which I think a lot of people had suspected for a while, so having this kind of solid evidence come out that the spot-on products potentially causing more harm than good, I think it's actually it could lead us into a more responsible direction in terms of if you look at equine medicine, for example, they are routinely doing fecal egg counts before administering antiparasitic products to avoid resistance. And we are finding resistance in in antiparasitics at the moment in small animals as well. So if it's leading us down that correct root of kind of being more proactive about when and where we're treating I think that's a, a a really good way to highlight it and this evidence has kind of helped this move along I, I would never encourage a pet owner to completely stop using anti-parasitics because especially in cases like if you have a cat with flea allergic dermatitis for example you, it's very important that you stay up to date with this but in kind of healthy cases you you can um speak to a veterinarian about moving over to potentially doing a fecal egg worm count but i would always speak to a a vet before yeah absolutely and that's more common practice like in the states i think they do like pretty much routine or as my understanding is routine Mm -hmm. fecal egg counts before um i guess the challenge becomes is not so much with those like intestinal worms and sure the fleas with the flea allergic dermatitis is bad for those animals that suffer it's using you know worried about maybe lungworm where i'm not sure where you are in the uk but you know we had a big 
problem with angiostrongylus, which is a lungworm that can cause bleeding. Um, there's Lyme disease, which is kind of picking up in prevalence across the world. It's now in every single state in the US. It's spread up into Canada. It's more widespread in the UK. So it's trying to find ways to protect our pets from from those kinds of potentially you know deadly diseases it's it's really interesting and i think that this research has kind of sparked a a kind of revolution and how we should be treating and thinking about it because it's very easy to get kind of stuck in a routine of ways of this is how it's been done before so this is how we should do it and there is room for innovation and research into this so there are certain antiparasitic products that are less harmful than the others but like you were saying in terms of the increasing prevalence of lungworm and Lyme's disease all of that comes with and as a consequence of the changing in climate and the larger the change in climate the more likely we are to have diseases become more prevalent in in the UK and in areas where they weren't before and this so I don't it's hard to kind of when you think about climate change you think about floods you think about people without food you think about mass migration but you you don't think about it close to home and people love their pets there's no doubt about it they really love their pets and it's kind of linking that and making the education and resources available for pet owners so that the link is e easily made that, OK, so this action, it may not feel like it's affecting me right now. But if I um, continue to buy lots of accessories, lots of toys, lots of food, that will have a huge impact via my pet on the planet. And then that can influence climate change which is influencing kind of the health of my planet, the health of yeah. my pet. And we, in that was a very simplistic view of it, obviously. But in veterinary medicine at vet school, we're taught about one health. We're taught about how, like how ingrained human health and animal health are so in, they're so interlinked. They are one. That's why one health is there. And if we can see that kind of if you look at tb for example there's so many examples of where you've got interlinking between animal and human health and climate change will be no different from that it will not only have a degrading effect on human health but it will also have a degrading effect on the health of our animals yeah, even if absolutely. it's from preventable diseases yeah. And from the One Health point of view, I mean, that wasn't really when I was coming through, that wasn't really a thing that was discussed. But I mean, there's no you don't need a bigger example than the fact that SARS and COVID both potentially started and spread in wet markets. Exactly. So that close interaction between people yeah, and animals is, is absolutely huge. It, I'm it's come to a point. So I was speaking to actually the one of the founders of a fantastic brand called Bico, and he started Beco back 12 years ago and at the time kind of the the brand is kind of focused on sustainable pet care and at, at the time when they were going to kind of all the dog events people were like well I love this product but why why does it need to be sustainable I I don't care whether it's ecologically sound I, ju I just want to I want a pet bowl and then he was saying the difference between then and then the change in attitude and views now with Gen Z and millennials coming up and that's something that they're really prioritising. The kind of change in attitude has been such a swing. He calls it the Attenborough effect. <laughs> like after Blue Planet, there was a surge in kind of in environmentalism. And I think that is definitely for the best. And I think it can have such a positive impact on, on veterinary medicine as well. We are such an innovative profession. We have so much room for kind of creating new normals. And we have such a huge influence on pet owners. And if we could use this to not only positively impact the health of pets, but also the health of the planet at the same time, then I think that would be um, a massive win for both sides. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really encouraging that that attitude shift is yeah very notable. And I guess there's a lot of actually going to the other extreme, a lot of climate anxiety, and people are really struggling with with the impact that they're having and and their lifestyle, and I guess their pets as well. Is there a risk that vets could be a little bit hypocritical because we are a, a massively plastic based profession and that you think of the number of syringes and needles it's all packed in plastic a lot of people are using disposable gowns i know there's a discussion about you know the the impact of those versus the old cotton ones but the the potential compromise in in the care and the sterility we're offering so what kind of things are our vets doing um to to kind of look at their impact and reduce their impact it's really interesting because i might i'll start kind of with your point about climate anxiety and I think that's something that is not discussed enough within the profession because we know that we have such a poor mental health as a whole. And it's something that is continuously being worked on by the BVA and RCVS, and they're really prioritising it at the moment. But climate anxiety can really affect your mental health especially if you're aware of this and then going into the practice and there are no substitutes currently for some of those virgin plastics that we use because we want to make sure that we're not compromising the health of our of the patients that we're seeing and that can really affect you on an individual basis if this is something that you're um, concerned about and so we need to kind of think about the welfare of our, the mental welfare of our of our vets alongside that um, and I know that veganism is a kind of a, a, a controversial topic in in some vets but I think also we we know that discrimination is not helpful for anyone in anywhere and the veterinary profession definitely do not stand for discrimination and I think if we need to be supportive of people who are choosing a vegan lifestyle because it is a protective view. There is also that. Um, but it's also kind of being welcoming to shifts in attitudes and behaviour and making sure that we are being um, kind and understanding to people who we don't need that kind of attitude within the veterinary profession. We've got enough that we are worrying about day to day. Yeah, yeah. I think some um, of those old schools, old school thoughts, are hopefully kind of dying. Yeah, dying yeah. out. And there's a, a, people are embracing all the other things as well, like recycling. There's. I was looking at um, a practice that was uh, built to be kind of almost energy neutral. Just you know, the insulation and all that kind of thing is much better. So all of these little things. I mean, it's like like the poo bags, isn't it? It's all these little changes that actually, if everyone starts doing them, it makes a makes a massive difference. So you kind of discuss, you kind of brought up food as a big a, a big impact. And I mean, as well, we've got like from a not so much a carbon point of view, but you know, if, if it's fish, if you're cat likes fish well you know those fish stocks are depleting you know across the planet and across the oceans um what kind of alternatives are there because there's a few different kind of insect based ones there's some plant-based diets and things what kind of things can people be thinking and what actually can they switch to today rather than waiting for for you know any new innovations to take place yeah so this is this is really interesting so in terms of what you can do right now is just looking at the kind of the back of your pet food packaging and seeing where this protein source in particular is coming from. So in terms of fish, you can buy foods now that are marine body certified, so MSC certified, and that means that they are being sustainably caught and sourced, not from fish farms. Usually they are pole or line caught, looking for we know that kind of depleting main predatory um, fish such as kind of salmon um, and tuna are more degrading on the environment than potentially having the your protein source being from haddock or or cod then you've also mentioned insect based protein which is another controversial topic within veterinary medicine at the moment so it, it's an amazing innovation and um, potentially 
could be life changing for hypoallergenic animals because it's classed as a novel protein. But uh, there hasn't been enough research into the kind of long term health effects of insect protein on cats and dogs. Um, and we have to be especially um, cautious about cats because of taurine deficiencies um, as obligate carnivores. Yeah. Um, so there is definitely more research needed into that kind of sphere of animal pet food. But I, I know that it's occurring at the moment and I think there's exciting things to come. And I would be interested in seeing the results of that. But as as we we are an evidence based profession, um, as vets, we can't really recommend insect based protein at the moment because of the lack of research. But um, definitely excited to, yeah. to watch this space. Watch exactly. this space, and even mm-hmm. like even if you're not, you know, even if you're choosing a standard, you know, bovine or or um, you know sheep based diet. There's a big switch to or like becoming more common, you know, like the premium, the human quality. I mean, there's all of these terms that get bandied around that don't necessarily mean anything. But people want to feed the the same steak that we're buying off the shelf. But the the, the potential there is that we're using less of the, the kind of the byproducts, which are still perfectly good. And it's just that that kind of terminology makes us think that people are, you know, kind of scraping the, the, the muck off the slaughterhouse floor, which isn't the case. And so we're, we're not using the whole of the animal. Um, yeah. And that has a bigger impact as well, doesn't it? No, definitely. It's it, like this is something I could talk about for hours, but it's it's so interesting kind of the shift. In, in in what we are feeding and expecting to give to our pets at the moment um we've we've gone from just having just brown pet food and their biscuits or kind of off cuts of, of meat and awful category three, three um waste and then you think compare that um to now when you dogs are being fed kind of prime cuts of meat um, that hugely increases the ecological paw print on the planet um, because you're having a whole nother animal that is being reared for that product and the, that waste product then is that would have been used is now going in, in the bin and so that animal has been raised and not all of it's being used which is even worse for the planet. And then you've got the kind of that shift in attitude also comes along with the organic and free range. And then from like a veterinary perspective as well, you have the kind of um, welfare issues in some of the cases, because you if you are certified organic, you can't use certain drugs to treat the animals because then you lose your accreditation for being organic. But in terms of environmental impact, we know that organic has less of an impact. So it's trying to work alongside farmers um, and, and st- like animal production to help them create a place of good welfare, but also reduce the impact that we have on the planet it's really interesting area but something i don't think is made clear enough to to pet owners you have this kind of greenwashing going on especially at the moment with kind of people saying this is sustainable this is good for your pet this is prime prime protein but it also comes along with the overconsumption of of pet products because we know that also it's it's the major majority of animals are actually overconsuming the energy they consume more energy than they need to sustain their normal activity levels and that links to pet obesity again like I think like I said um, earlier on in this conversation it it's the the main disease that we have in the UK and in the US is pet obesity and it's majorly overlooked because you see these cute fat cats and they look really fluffy and like Garfield and 
everybody yeah, wants yeah it, it's funny have. like every 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 conversation that i have and every every <laughs> piece of content that i do there's always a, there's always a mention of obesity it's such a you know it's such a huge issue and it, it has such a massive impact on on everything else really that yeah. that kind of increase in consumption you just made me think you know there's all these things like the the monthly dog boxes and things that have got three different toys for your dog and a couple of snacks and all that kind of thing and it's just if you think about it it's pretty disgusting that you know you think that your dog needs all, all that when there's homemade options and really they just want your attention and a bit of exercise and all that kind of thing they don't need all of these fluffy squeaky ducks and, and and whatever it is that gets destroyed within two seconds there's so much room for improvement but like it's always progress over perfection in these yeah. areas there's you can buy the most eco-friendly toy that is that's going to compost in your garden within 90 days but there will also there will that will also have an impact on the planet nothing is zero impact we just need to make sure that we're making changes within our pets' lifestyles that are reducing that impact. Yeah. And it, the significance of reducing that impact on on the personal level is, is huge. It's really big. People think that you can't do anything as an individual to, to change it. But if if everybody thought that way, then kind of nothing would, would happen. And your individual impact over the life of your your pet is, is is really it's really significant and if you can make small changes just kind of changing from your usual plastic poo bags to a compostable poo bag is is still like a huge change in and it's not just change on the planet and the change in your lifestyle but it's a change on kind of a social level as well if we're all being more conscious of the way that we're treating the planet, then we become more conscious of kind of the environment, whether that's social or kind of like the physical environment around us. And that can only bring good things in, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to kind of finish off like, and this might be a pretty difficult question that doesn't have a good answer, but like if <laughs> like for things that, that people can do, like what would be your like three top you know, changes that most people would probably be able to make with their dog or cat that, you know, they can make today? Yeah, so definitely have a look at the back of your, your food packets. Have have a look. If, if you can see where this protein source is coming from and how they source it, um, then that's fantastic. If, if you can't and you have no idea, then I would look into changing it. Um, there are so many alternatives out there at the moment. Look for MSC certified fish. Look for wild caught. Look for pole caught. If you're looking for kind of turkey or chicken, look for free range or organic if you can. I know that there's financial um, constraints in these areas, but there are some alternatives that are available for people. So there's that's such a huge impact that you can make throughout your pet's lifetime another thing would be if you can just look for swaps easy swaps day to day which i'm sure your pets will find really fun is changing to more sustainably sourced material toys so look for kind of bamboo hemp that they're they're really they're lots of fun <laughs> my dog has not noticed the difference at all and there are some great toys made out of old plastic bottles as well which is also limiting your impact on the planet and is so much fun for your pets as well and then in terms of kind of dealing with your pet's waste there are amazing brands that have got compostable poo bags and um, biodegradable cat litter um, just all, all things like that that you can make within your animal's lifestyle that can benefit their health and benefit the health of the planet as well yeah perfect and then you can at least feel like you're doing something and not having to wait for that next innovation in you know sustainable plastic production or whatever it whatever hopefully comes about that's fantastic maddie so where if people wanted to learn more about kind of this topic and also about the work and everything that you're doing around this where would be the best place for or best places for them to for them to go yeah, so Vet Sustain is a kind of veterinary innovation area within the environmentalism sphere. 
and we are working on resources for the veterinary profession to use and um, which can be found on our website and in our Facebook pages and we're also working on providing resources for owners as well for pet owners at Pet Panion on our Instagram as my pet Panion. And we are working very hard in the background to create lots of exciting new things where you can track your ecological paw print of, of your pet and learn more about how to reduce that. But they're all exciting things and I very much look forward to sharing them with everyone soon. Perfect. Oh, that's fantastic, Maddie. There's so much to think about and so many different things to unpack with um, our conversation today. So yeah, thanks very much for coming along. No, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I really, really enjoyed the conversation that I had with Dr. Maddie Hewitson. It was a hugely important topic, like I said at the very beginning, and there was loads that I learnt as well in that chat. So it's very difficult sometimes to keep up with all of the different aspects of anything to do with veterinary medicine and our pet's health, but the environmental impact of our lives is just becoming more and more apparent and yeah I was so pleased that there was some fantastic take home changes that we can all make in our lives today and definitely some things to look for in the future now clearly it's not as straightforward as you might imagine and one thing that seems good on one hand may be detrimental on the other but so long as we're thinking about these things and we're trying to make the right changes that can only be a good thing. And if you want to find out more about Maddie and the work that she's doing, you want to follow some of those links and resources that she mentioned, or you just want to dive deeper into this topic, then make sure you check out all of the links which will be in the show notes over at callthevet.org. Like I said at the beginning too, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, what changes might you have made already to reduce your pet's impact? What do you think of these uh, subscription boxes, for example? Do you subscribe to them? And maybe are you going to change your mind as a result of today's show? I'd love to hear your thoughts over on Instagram where you can find me at Our Pets Health. And I'd also really appreciate you sharing this episode with your friends and family, not only to help impact the planet, which is clearly huge, but I'd love to help reach more people so that I can help more dedicated dog and cat owners optimize the health and well-being of their entire family including their furry family members so I'd appreciate that so much next week I'm answering another one of your fantastic questions and so until then I'm Dr Alex this is the Call the Vet show take great care thanks for listening to Call the Vet For full show notes and any links mentioned in today's show, head over to callthevet.org, where you can also submit your question to be featured on an upcoming episode. We'll see you next time.